Welcome to the Child Mind Institute's 10th annual On the Shoulders of Giants Scientific Symposium, which celebrates the contributions of mentorship and collaboration in the fields of developmental neuroscience and child and adolescent mental health. Today, we are thrilled to welcome Tom Boyce, Professor Emeritus at the University of California, San Francisco, and his protégés, Nikki Bush and Danielle Rubino. I'm sure their talks on how early life mm -hmm. adversity affects physical and psychological health will be informative and inspiring. And I'm so proud that the Child Mind Institute can facilitate a conversation about how our knowledge of development can lead to concrete interventions to improve mental health in our most vulnerable children. This is central to the mission of the Child Mind Institute. We're an independent national nonprofit dedicated to transforming the lives of children and adolescents who are struggling with mental health and learning disorders. We offer state-of-the-art clinical care for children and adolescents at two clinical centers, one in New York and one in the San Francisco Bay Area, and now via telehealth. And in almost 11 years, we've helped over 50,000 families, and we've reached over 50 million parents and teachers and remain committed to providing free information and resources for parents in need on childmind.org and on social media and through our annual May public uh, awareness campaign, which this year was called Hashtag We Thrive Inside, which received over 4 billion media impressions and more than one uh, over 250 million people came to watch these videos. And we're supporting our nation's schools and communities by providing school-based mental health interventions and helping schools build their own capacity to support mental health needs of their students. These programs have become even more necessary during the pandemic, and we are now in over 250 schools nationwide, including a very ambitious partnership to bring support and emotional, social-emotional learning curriculum to literally every classroom in the New York City public school system. But today we're here to talk about science and research, our research program at the Child Mind Institute is a global leader in open source innovation and data sharing in neuroscience, brain imaging, wearable behavioral health technologies, and internet-based treatment and assessment. Our tools for discovery are being used around the world, and the work of our engineers and our data scientists is changing how researchers do science everywhere. And our discoveries are changing how people think about child and adolescent mental health. Our Healthy Brain Network study is enrolling 10,000 young people with mental health and learning disorders to uncover the biomarkers of these disorders. And as the COVID-19 pandemic forced us to temporarily close the doors to our offices, we made an almost overnight shift to remote operations. So this allowed us to continue service serving families in need with free comprehensive evaluations and treatment referrals that are the hallmark of the study. And our work during COVID-19 continues as we collect data on how young people, parents, first responders, and others are responding to the pandemic through our Crisis Logger website and our Mind Logger app. But before we begin the presentations, I just have a few pieces of business to attend to. First, just before this event, we held the ceremony of our annual Rising Scientists Scholarship winners. Each year, we recognize five high school seniors from the New York area who demonstrate exceptional promise in child mental health and neuroscience research. Hunter College and the Child Mind Institute co-fund a scholarship, which give each winning student $2,000 toward college expenses. This year, for the first time, we opened nominations nationwide and had 45 outstanding finalists. And I'd like to take a moment to recognize the winners. I hope you'll join me in appreciating these remarkable young people. They are not only remarkable in their science achievement, but incredibly well-rounded in their extracurricular activities, in their philanthropic efforts, and just in general, being all-round students. These five include Reed Lessing of the Chapin School in New York, Ethan Acasio of the New School of Northern Virginia in Fairfax, Virginia, Hong Nguyen of Leesville Road High in Raleigh, North Carolina, Nikita Rohila of Stuttgart, High School in Stuttgart, Arkansas, and Julia Savino of Smithtown West High School in Smithtown on Long Island, New York. Second, after each of the presentations of On the Shoulders of Giants, we'll take a few questions from the audience. If you have a question, please type it in the questions window on the GoToWebinar panel, and questions will be reviewed and presented to the speakers. And finally, 
uh, this president, this group of presentations on the shoulders of giants will end at about 6.15. We'll take a brief break, break. And at 6.30, I hope you'll join us for a remarkable roundtable moderated by NIDA's director, Nora Volkow, exploring the impact of racism and inequality on children's mental health, as well as on the future of training in the field. Previous Sarah Gunn Prize honorees will make up the panel, including this year's honoree, Tom Boyce, Felton Tony Earls, Professor Emeritus of Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School, Tom Insull, former director of the NIMH, and co-founder and president of Mind Strong Health, Kenneth Dodge, professor of psychology and neuroscience at Duke, Javier Casalanos, professor of radiology and neuroscience at the NYU Langone Medical Center, Yasmin Hurd, director of the Mount Sinai Addiction Institute, Jerry Kagan, professor emeritus of psychology at Harvard University, and John Weiss, professor of psychology at Harvard University. To introduce our first presenter and the 2020 recipient of the Sarah Gunn Prize for Research and Mentorship in Child Mental Health. Please welcome my very good friend, learning specialist and philanthropist, Sarah Gunn. Welcome, and thank you for joining us at the 10th Annual On the Shoulders of Giant Scientific Symposium. Each year, the recipient of the Sarah Gunn Prize for Research and Mentorship in Child Mental Health is chosen based on accomplishments in developmental neuroscience and child and adolescent psychiatry, commitment to community, and a passion for mentoring the next generation. I'd like to thank the Child Mind Institute Scientific Research Council for their hard work in selecting a remarkable recipient for 2020. It's a great, great honor that this prize carries my name and that I get to bestow it on an incredibly deserving man, Dr. Tom Boyce. I'm so happy that Dr. Boyce is here today as part of On the Shoulders of Giants to present to the audience with two of his protégés. Dr. Boyce is a professor emeritus of psych pediatrics and psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco, where he formerly served as the Lisa and John Pritzker Distinguished Professor of Developmental and Behavioral Health. He is a member of the Institute of Medicine and recently the author of the book, The Orchid and the Dandelion. At his lab at UCSF, Dr. Boyce studied the interplay of socioeconomic adversity and the neuro neurobiological responses. Over decades of pioneering research, Dr. Boyce has demonstrated how psychological stress and the brain's response to negative social environments produce mental health disorders in childhood populations. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome a true innovator in children's mental health for today and for tomorrow, Dr. Tom Boyce. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Gunn, for that uh, kind introduction. Dr. Koplowitz, uh, members of the Scientific Research Council and leaders of the Child Mind Institute, I want to first tell you how truly honored and humbled I am to receive the 2020 Sarah Gunn Prize in Child Mental Health. I am so grateful for your recognition and, and immensely proud to accept this magnificent award. Let me get my slide started here. I've chosen as the uh, title for my brief presentation uh, today, The Tenderness of Childhood, Orchids, Dandelions, and the Intergenerationality of Developmental Science. Given the intergenerationality theme of this uh, symposium today, it's only fitting that I would tell you something about the giants on whose shoulders I stood as I began my work uh, early in my career. And those were John Castle, a South African epidemiologist and chair of epidemiology at UNC Chapel Hill, who studied social conditions and chronic disease in the apartheid-mandated Zulu homeland of the 1950s. 
and Lynn Stein, uh, Chair of Epidemiology at UC Berkeley, who pioneered research on social support as a moderating factor in stress-related morbidities. And together, these two men were uh, the progenitors, really, of the social epidemiology discipline as a health sciences uh, discipline. So those are, the, those are the shoulders that I began uh, my work on. Now, we're, we're very much aware of, of many of the determinants of child health um, and well-being. Uh, those include uh, infection, obviously one of, the, uh, one of the major determinants of health in children, at least in past years and, and uh, in current years as well. Uh, toxins, exposures to environmental toxins, diet and the adequacy of nutrition, uh, health care, uh, the provision of health care, the availability of health care, the kind of housing and shelter that the child receives, exposures to violence, both in the family and in the community, and the quality and effectiveness of the parenting uh, that a child also receives. What is missing, however, from this list is the role of adversity and trauma that for many, many years was a kind of unknown determinant of child health, both of mental health and physical health and uh, was only begun to be studied as a serious uh, contributor to the well-being of children uh, 10, 20, uh, 30 years ago. And the reason for that is shown uh, in this slide, which shows that two-thirds of children and adolescents experience a potentially traumatic event or adversity by the age of 16. So it is this amazing uh, uh, very high prevalence of uh, adversity and trauma that probably accounts for the fact that for so many years it was overlooked as a major determinant of child health. There is uh, a kind of hidden epidemic, if you will, of child trauma and adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And these are things like maltreatment, uh, exposure to intimate partner violence, parent substance abuse or mental illness, the death of a parent or caretaker, natural disasters, divorce and single parenthood, parent incarceration, poverty, and exposures to racism and social subordination. Now, why do we believe that these adverse childhood experiences are important to the well-being of children and youth? Well, one reason is because they may partially explain why there is such a disparity, disparity in health between children growing up in poverty and those growing up in middle-income families. And as you can see in this graph, when we look at the density of housing, other housing problems, uh, noise in the ambient uh, environment of the family, family turmoil and violence, that in every case, those children growing up in poverty have far more in the way of these exposures than do middle-income uh, children. Now, to be sure, middle-income children also have exposures to risk factors like violence and noise and so on. But it is clearly true that the children in impoverished environment have much more in the way of these adverse exposures than do children growing up in middle-income families. We also care about adverse childhood experiences because of their consequences. There are mental health consequences of, of such experiences. This slide just shows uh, on the vertical axis, lifetime history of depressive disorders and symptoms as a function of increasing level of adverse childhood experiences uh, over time. And you can see that there is this kind of monotonic graded association very potent and significant association between adverse experiences and symptoms and diagnoses of depression. Similarly, it is true that these kinds of significant adversities in early life seem to impair development in the first three years as well. So on the vertical axis of this graph is the percentage of children with developmental delays. And again, on the horizontal axis, the number of uh, ACEs experienced uh, during childhood. And again, you can see this significant, steep, uh, monotonic gradient 
according to adverse childhood experiences in the percentage of children with developmental delays. Now, these, these adversity experiences that happen in childhood do not just stay in childhood, it, it turns out, as well. And if we look at the odds of chronic disease in adulthood, like cardiovascular disease, again, we see this uh, increased uh, rates of adverse uh, of cardiovascular disease risk according to the adverse childhood experiences experienced by uh, that child. So what, what happens in childhood doesn't stay in childhood, but echoes on into the decades of adult life. Um, this is the, the actual data points that underlie the association between ACEs scores and depressive disorders. And what you can see is that there's a tremendous amount of variation. There are children who have very low levels of ACEs scores who have significant levels of uh, depressive symptoms. And there are other children who have relatively high levels of ACE scores that have very little in the way of, of, of depression. So there is this amazing amount of variation in all of these associations with early childhood adversity. And very early in this work, we began to struggle with the question of, is this just noise or is this actually the music that we ought to be looking at? Is it just the noise of uh, imperfect measures of the, uh, the, the components of the association? Is it bad study design? And we struggled for many years to try to clean up these associations, eliminating the kind of variation that I've just shown you. Finally, we began to believe that this is not the noise, but actually the music, this variation in children's responsivity to stress that is the actual uh, thing that we ought to be listening to. So we began bringing children into laboratories, sitting them down in front of a previously unknown examiner and asking them to do a series of mildly uh, but significantly stressful tasks. And while we were doing that, we monitored peripheral signs of the activation of the two principal stress response system in the human uh, central nervous system. And those are the CRH system, the corticotrophin releasing hormone system, which is centered here in the hypothalamus, and the locus ceruleus norepinephrine system, which is centered in this little uh, nucleus in the brainstem. CRH system is responsible for the output of the classic stress, cort stress hormone cortisol, and the locus ceruleus norepinephrine system is responsible for the activation of the autonomic nervous system, which ignites the entire fight or flight resp response. So we brought children into the laboratory, and let me show you a little bit about what their results looked like. Probably 80%, certainly the majority of children, had measures of stress reactivity. In this case, I'm just showing you mean arterial blood pressure that were relatively low and relatively unvarying over the course of these challenging tasks that we were asking them to complete. But there was a subset of children, about 20%, usually about one in five, who in response to these challenging tasks showed mean arterial pressures and other measures of autonomic and adrenocortical response that were highly varied and much higher than the children uh, in, that, that had these kinds of, of data points. So this kind of great variability in children's responsivity biologically to the challenging tasks that they were presented. So we could then take this measure of stress reactivity and we could move those into the real world setting where of course children have exposures to adversity and stress in their natural environments as well. And we could study the laboratory-based stress reactivity uh, as, a, uh, as a determinant in part of the kinds of outcomes that children experience uh, with adversity and stress in their natural environments. So if we looked at here on the vertical axis, uh, behavioral disorders, the incidence of respiratory disease, injuries, all of these pediatric, highly prevalent kinds of uh, outcomes. And we looked at those as a function of low stress or high stress in the ambient social environments that children were growing up in, we found these results. 
we found first that the children who had these kinds of relatively low magnitude stress reactivity profiles uh, had just about the same levels of these outcomes that we would like to avoid in both low stress and high stress setting. It's almost no increase under conditions of naturally occurring stress. But in contrast to that, the children who had profiles of relatively high stress reactivity, as we had predicted, had much higher in the rates of behavioral disorders, respiratory disease, and injuries under conditions of naturally occurring stress in their real world environments. And this was the this is what we hypothesized. This is what we were anticipating that we would find. But what we didn't anticipate was this finding, that children who were equally high in reactivity, equally high stress reactivity profiles in their adrenocortical and autonomic systems, when they were in, in situations that were characterized by low stress, by support, and by predictability, they didn't just have the normative baseline levels that were characteristic of their low reactivity peers, they had far lower rates of these outcomes than did uh, their peers with low stress reactivity. So we began, there is a, there is a Swedish uh, idiomatic expression called maskrosbarn, which means dandelion child, and we began to adopt that nomenclature for these children who had just about the same levels of behavioral disorders and other forms of morbidity, um, regardless of the kind of setting that they were in. Just like the dandelion that is able to grow in fertile mountain fields, to grow in the cracks of sidewalk, grow between bricks and a, a brick wall, dandelions are hardy plants that seem to be able to thrive and flourish almost anywhere they are planted. And we countered that with the neologism of orchida barn or orchid child that we wanted to reflect that children who had either the best or the worst outcomes, depending upon the kind of social context, the kind of supportiveness and nurturance of the environments in which they were being reared. So the orchid and the dandelion. Clinically, we have learned over the years that these dandelion children are often extroverted, they're comfortable with novel situations, and they have this characteristic average health in both low and high stress settings. Clinically, what we have found in children who have the profile of high stress reactivity is that they are often shy, they often withdraw from novel situations, they have sensory sensitivities uh, that are characteristic of their profiles behaviorally, and most importantly, they seem to have the best or the worst health outcomes, depending upon the context in which they find themselves. So we formulated this differential susceptibility hypothesis, that there was this spectrum of susceptibility to the social world, anchored by orchid children and dandelion children, but a continuum of susceptibility to stress and uh, adversity in the environments in which uh, children are being raised. Now, in the years since the formulation of that hypothesis, there have been many other investigators who have validated and replicated these results, and there have been many who have gone on to uh, tell us much more about differential susceptibility. And in particular, we've learned now about animal models that seem to mimic uh, the differential susceptibility of human children. We've learned something about the neurobiologic mechanisms that underlie differential susceptibility. We know more and more about the genetic and epigenetic mechanisms that are also important and underpin these differences in sensitivity. And we're increasingly understanding something about developmental time and how, how these, the, the acquisition of susceptibility to the environment plays out over uh, development and over the passage of time as children grow uh, and, and uh, develop. Important to all of these uh, lines of research has been the finding that there is a critical role that cross-disciplinarity and integrative science play in helping us understand these kinds of phenomena. Uh, 
So let me give you a, just a snippet, a, a little sampling of developments in each of those four areas. Uh, within animal models, uh, Marla Sokolowski and her colleagues in her lab at the University of Toronto have uh, studied Drosophila melanogaster, uh, the fruit fly. Marla is responsible for identifying the foraging gene that differentiates between uh, two different behavioral phenotypes of fruit flies, the rovers who are high in uh, exploratory behavior and the sitters who tend to, as the name implies, not have as high exploratory behavior. But when she stresses these animals by increasingly depriving them of larval food, what she finds is that the, that the rover uh, flies have just about the same levels of exploratory behavior uh, in both low, uh, low food um, availability settings and those that are normal, whereas the sitter flies have the highest rates of exploratory behavior uh, in, the, in the condition of uh, food deprivation and lower than normal uh, uh, le levels of exploratory behavior um, in, the, uh, in the, the, the normal availability of larval food. Similarly, in rhesus macaques, Steve Simi and I years ago um, at the NIH um, studied uh, reactivity and stress in rhesus monkeys who were in a, um, in a troop of macaques living in a free-ranging environment. Uh, we had previously identified those that, had, that were low in reactivity versus those that were high in reactivity. And we, we examined these, uh, these monkeys under uh, con conditions of both low stress during a conventional year in which nothing particularly perturbing was happening. And in a naturally occurring confinement year when the animals were uh, necessarily confined to a, a small cinder, cinder block, block building. And what we found was that the high reactivity animals had either the lowest rates of violent injuries in the low stress year preceding the confinement or the highest rates of uh, of um, violent injuries at the hands of their peers uh, under conditions of confinement. And by contrast to that, those who were low reactivity had about the same levels of violent injuries, irrespective of whether they were experiencing stress or not. So here again, this kind of orchid and dandelion phenomenon, where the dandelion monkeys show approximately the same levels of untoward uh, outcomes uh, in both kinds of conditions, whereas the the, uh, the orchid or the high reactivity animals showed either the worst outcomes or the best outcomes, depending upon the kinds of settings in which they were uh, uh, living and, and being bred. With regard to neurobiologic neurobi mechanisms, um, the uh, reactivity of the amygdala has been studied as a moderator of socioeconomic influences on income and antisocial behavior in early adulthood. Remind you that the amygdala is a cluster of temporal lobe nuclei involved in emotional responses, and these investigators studied young men from low-income urban environments and examined the influence of socioeconomic status and resources on monthly income and antisocial uh, behavior. Socioeconomic resources ascertained at age 20 and the outcome variables ascertained at age 22. And what you can see here is that those with high uh, reactivity in the amygdala nuclei showed higher levels of monthly income under conditions of abundant socioeconomic resources and lower levels of antisocial behavior under the same conditions of higher levels of socioeconomic uh, resources. So again, this phenomenon of kind of the best or the worst of outcomes among those with amygdala reactivity, depending upon the kind of socioeconomic resources uh, that they had uh, access to. Mason Latsko and her colleagues in the Mini Silvera lab at uh, Montreal at McGill University have developed a polygenic risk score for differential susceptibility. Uh, they developed this in a translational mouse model uh, 
where genes were identified with enhanced expression in both supportive and aversive social conditions. The human gene orthologs uh, were identified and tested then in four large culturally distinct human cohorts. The Maven study uh, in Montreal, the Gusto study uh, in, the, in uh, Singapore, the ALSPAC study of Bristol, UK, and the UK uh, Biobank. And what they have found is that this polygenic risk score moderated the association between environmental risk and symptoms of anxiety and depression uh, um, in, in all four of these, of these uh, longitudinal studies. So in each one of these, those with the high PRS, the high polygenic risk score, had the highest rates of, in this case, anxiety and the lowest rates, uh, depending upon the kind of environment in which the children uh, were being uh, reared. And each of these, uh, all they, though they all, in a, in a sense, showed differential susceptibility, these two also showed this phenomenon of the, the high PRS individuals having lower rates of anxiety and depression in those, those conditions where the environment was most beneficial and supportive. We have also studied the effects of epigenetic uh, mechanisms on uh, DNA methylation in biobehavioral inhibition scores in adolescents. I'll remind you that um, the epigenome, this lattice work of uh, chemical tags that lies atop uh, the gene uh, sequence, um, has profound influences on the packaging of the DNA, the packaging of the chromatin that either, either allows or disallows the decoding of the DNA and thus the expression of, those, of the gene. And these chemical tags seem to appear related to characteristics of the family and other community environments in which children are being raised. We've studied this in 120 children from the Wisconsin Study of Families and Work, uh, the work of Marilyn Essex and her uh, colleagues in Madison, Wisconsin. We uh, sampled buccal epithelial cells from these children, and we found significant differences in DNA methylation by the level of biobehavioral inhibition and disinhibition. In other words, the kind of orchid child traits of fearfulness, temperamental negativity, and high autonomic reactivity. And these differences were especially large and broad in two specific genes, DLX5, which is a homeobox gene involved in neuron, craniofacial, and bone development, and IGF2, uh, a growth factor gene that promotes uh, cell differentiation and pro proliferation uh, during gestation. And finally, with respect to developmental time, uh, we are uh, increasingly find, finding that critical periods play a role in the acquisition of this kind of susceptibility as well. So this is, uh, these are data from the Bucharest Early Intervention Project, um, headed by uh, Chuck Nelson, Nathan Fox, and Charlie Zena. And this, uh, these data show uh, how foster placement at different ages uh, affects the IQ and developmental quotient of children being reared initially in uh, Romanian orphanages. And what it shows is that children uh, placed in, in foster homes after the age of 24 months had significantly lower levels of IQ and DQ compared to children who were placed before the age of 24 months who themselves had uh, normal or near normal uh, IQ and DQ uh, scores. So a kind of critical period in the effects of foster placement on inst institutionalized children. Taken together, this accumulating evidence, uh, I believe, suggests a plausible role of triadic interactions among genes, environments, and time in the genesis of physical and mental health outcomes. The model further suggests that the developmental pathways between these complex gene, environment, time interactions uh, 
and the physical and mental health of human populations may involve biological mediators and moderators, one of which is differential susceptibility and the ability to, to mount a response of resilience. And now, of course, we uh, this, this research and all the other research that we are, are doing uh, has come face to face with these twin afflictions of the COVID-19 pandemic and uh, the increasing uh, realization of a systemic American uh, ra racism. One of these afflictions is a prolonged but impermanent calamity. The other is an enduring wrong toward an entire sector of our society. And they likely have multiplicative uh, effects. They, might, they likely uh, have effects that multiply one on to the other. Certainly both have and are having profound and lasting consequences for the well-being of children and youth. And there's every reason to believe that these kinds of compelling differences in differential susceptibility in children's responses are having effects within this pandemic and within systemic racism exposure as well. Uh, differences in responses in lived experience, behavior and learning, responses within frontal limbic circuitry, immunologic and stress response systems, and in patterns of gene expression. These are differences that we believe should guide how the nation studies and answers the afflictions of the coronavirus uh, infection and racism. Finally, my last slide, returning to the engaging theme of this symposium, Developmental science is inherently intergenerational. There is a potent intergenerationality in the developmental influences of grandparents on grandkids. There is increasing evidence for an intergenerational transmission of trauma, possibly through epigenetic processes. And there is the privilege we have, we all have as scientists and teachers of watching proudly as students and trainees emerge into their own professional lives, lives that will exceed and ultimately transcend our own. I'm delighted that two of my exceptional past postdoctoral fellows could be here today to tell you uh, of their own remarkable and promising research, Drs. Nikki Bush and Danielle Rubinoff. Okay, thank you, Tom. Um, we have time for a question. So two related questions, Tom, for you. Uh, the focus uh, is on the cumulative risk model of ACES, where more translates into greater impact. However, there are challenges to this model that haven't been discussed. So one, different types of adversity have different impact on the brain. Uh, for example, threat versus deprivation. And two, the ACES are scores of adversity, not the toxic toxic response to adversity. So could you discuss these two points from your perspective and knowledge of the literature? Well, it, it certainly is the case that, that the effects of trauma are, uh, are specific and uh, different kinds of trauma. Maltreatment has very different kinds of biological effects uh, than does exposure, for example, to, um, uh, to poverty and, and racism. So uh, it, it is clear that the biological responses both in the brain and in the periphery uh, are very specific to the kinds of uh, uh, adversities that uh, children experience. Um, could you say the second part again, Harold? So the second part was that the ACEs are scores of adversity, not the toxic response to adversity. So, you know, exactly. from your perspective and knowledge, literature, how does that play out? Yeah, well, that's exactly the point. Um, prior to uh, the advent of, of, of looking at differential susceptibility, we saw only that adversity, cumulative adversity over time had effects on physical and mental health outcome. What we were ignoring up until that point in time was that there's a tremendous amount of variation from one child to another in their responsivity to those, to those ACEs. So it's, it's very important that we understand that there is a, a diversity of responses and that, that uh, children uh, have a whole spectrum 
of uh, differences in uh, biological response to the kinds of adversity um, that they experience and that those differences in uh, responsivity figure very prominently in the kind of outcomes uh, that they that they uh, have. Thank you. We have some other questions, but we're going to hold them uh, and we're going to move on. Thank you, Tom. We're going to move on to your first protege, um, Dr. Uh, Nikki Bush. Dr. Bush? I'm so thrilled that Tom was honored with this award. It's an incredible privilege to be able to highlight some of the influence that standing on his shoulders has provided me in my career. Tom is perhaps best known for his contributions to theories around differential susceptibility, which he just reviewed with elegance. I'm most certainly an orchid, at least by most measures. And although I've been fortunate to have several incredible mentors across my career, Tom provided an exceptionally remarkably supportive nurturing context in which I could thrive and I would argue develop better than expected outcomes. He served as a cloth monkey in my training, a secure base from which I could explore and take risks. And moreover, I benefited tremendously from his gift at collaboration and mentorship. In particular, he treated me as though I were a pluripotent stem cell with the capacity to study whatever I felt would lead to the best solutions. And that perspective was transformative. He co-founded the Robert Wood Johnson Health and Society Scholars Program uh, at UCSF with Nancy Adler, which was an interdisciplinary breeding ground and a think tank of sorts to address our nation's largest public health crises. And I had the incredible benefit of being challenged by and learning within this context and focusing on mental health. And he also encouraged me to bring my developmental lens to the conversation, especially when I saw that it was lacking. Tom showed you this image a few moments ago. In the 13 years we've worked together, we tackled questions across each of these various domains, but I was most compelled to understand the role of time and sensitive periods of development. We examined individual differences in genetics, autonomic nervous system, and HVA access reactivity, and other systems, as well as their interaction with a range of environments. Tom talked a lot about these findings, and Danielle will tell you more. But we considered neighborhood, family, classroom context, and more recently have begun to expand and understand the chemical environmental exposure. We've always focused on generalized susceptibility factors, common risk factors for physical and mental health outcomes to optimize discovery and impact. However, we examined developmental processes early in life that contributed to phenotypes of disease risk rather than waiting for the disease to manifest. And it was through this lens that we considered interactions that occurred over time among and within biological systems and individuals' environments, as well as the biological embedding of early life experience, accounting for that shaping of stress reactivity and other biological systems iteratively and over time. These phenomena occur across the life course, although the effects are greatest in early life, as Tom highlighted. Also working with Tom and Nancy Adler, we've always worked to address how socioeconomic status shapes our opportunities and experiences and subsequently our biology. One of our early papers in this realm focused on kindergarten children. We found that at age five, greater family adversity and poverty uniquely predicted heightened daily cortisol arousal across three days in kindergarten. Excessive glucocorticoid arousal over time can lead to damaged bodily tissues, compensatory activity in other systems, and mental and physical disorders. This work provided some of the first evidence for allostatic load beginning in early childhood. We followed this up looking at the children in age nine. In particular, we found social determinants predicted differential methylation in these nine-year-old children in low side of high relevance for mental and physical health. To dig a little bit deeper, we found income and education and family social adversity Hola. predicted um, both decreased methylation, which typically corresponds to greater levels of gene expression or activation, as well as increased methylation at some sites which usually corresponds to the silencing of genes, which prevents them from releasing the information they carry. That could be good or bad. It's happening at age nine. Findings like this reveal the broad and sophisticated influence of social determinants on factors that could influence mental health across the life course. I began to speak, think specifically about intergenerational transmission. Now you're unmuted. The body. Thank you very much. You click that and you've got video. Yeah. Okay. But I don't know I'm that listening, you... I'm listening to a speech. I'm not. No on. one can see you. That's right. Because I'm not on. I'm not on to I get food. that. But you may need to click that so that people can see you. Okay. So right now we can hear Jerry. So could you mute him again? Because we're in the middle of the presentation. 
Thanks. Thank you. I began to focus on prenatal programming after learning that maternal stress related circulating cortisol crosses through the placenta, accounting for up to one third of the variability in fetal cortisol levels. Fetal glucocorticoids play a role in regulating fetal growth, brain development, and organ maturation, which are all critical factors for mental and physical health. So I wanted to dig into this deeper. In my first R01, we found evidence that the more types of major stressful life events that a woman experienced in pregnancy, events such as the death of a loved one, loss of a job, divorce, domestic violence, homelessness, the more stress reactive her child was, in particular in, her, in the child's parasympathetic nervous system. Reactivity in the system is associated with both internalizing and externalizing disorders in childhood and adolescence, as well as making children more sensitive to their context, as Thomas highlighted. For better or worse, this could be adaptive, but we don't know the short term or long term. We also found that each additional type of major stressful life event experienced in pregnancy was associated with a 40% greater odds of rapid infant weight gain, which is associated with increased risk for obesity during childhood and corresponds with executive function, mental health, and cardiometabolic health later in life. We also found that perceived stress mattered a lot. Women who reported greater stress during their pregnancies had babies who were more physically ill across the first year of life, as ascertained by medical records abstraction. They showed higher rates of infectious illness and non-infectious illness. And remarkably, not only were they sick more often, but they had a greater diversity of illness, suggesting pervasive effects. In another sample, we examined the potential role of sensitive periods for the development of women's reproductive physiology. We found that trauma that women experience in their own childhoods after adjusting for exposure to traumatic stressors across their life course and those which occurred specifically during pregnancy, that those predicted women's level of placental corticotropin releasing hormone in late pregnancy, as well as the rise of those levels across pregnancy, decades after the trauma was experienced. This is striking because the level and rise of this hormone is a strong predictor of prematurity and birth weight, and it was true in this sample as well. PCRH is also a robust predictor of maternal mental health postpartum, as well as child neurodevelopmental and mental health outcomes across childhood. So finding this transgenerational transmission of adversity in the mother's childhood is quite potentially profound. In the same sample, we found more evidence for intergenerational transmission. Cross-lag repeated measures analysis show that childhood trauma predicted higher pre and postnatal maternal psychopathology, as well as child developmental milestones across age one to four. Remark remarkably, these models showed multiple indirect effects via psychopathology, but also direct effects of maternal childhood trauma on age four milestones, suggesting both pre and postnatal programming mechanisms are at play. But I'm an optimist. I was trained as a prevention scientist, so I began to ask whether we could positively program stress reactivity with intervention. I was fortunate enough to work with some great people at UCSF to find that a mindfulness-based stress reduction and health promotion group intervention for eight weeks during pregnancy led to a clinically meaningful reduction in depression and perceived stress post-intervention. More importantly, these positive effects were sustained through at least 18 months postpartum. Latent class analyses revealed an effective treatment such that women had almost eight times greater odds of being in the moderate depressive symptom class if they were in the treatment as usual group. It was exciting that Daniel Rubinoff followed this up with longitudinal cross-lag path analyses, which showed that maternal depression at 18 months was associated with her child's internalizing symptoms concurrently, but also her child's symptom at age four, adjusting for all other concurrent longitudinal associations. So the prenatal intervention findings on maternal mental health appear to have had meaningful impact not only on her well-being, but on that of her child four to five years later. Mixed model analyses of repeated measures also revealed that babies born to women in the intervention demonstrated greater sympathetic reactivity to the stressor at the appropriate time, as well as better sympathetic reactivity. We also found using second-by-second -second objectively coded behavior of infants that babies born to women in the intervention had more self-regulatory behavior and less negative behaviors. These effects may occur through the biological programming in utero or postnatal maternal stress differences or parenting behaviors. Our data suggests it goes through all three. Collectively, this work demonstrates not only biological embedding of stress across the life course, but also that these effects are transgenerational with a mother's own adversity influencing the program on her offspring decades later but also that these phenomena can be positively influenced by intervention, 
children's mental health must be considered within the family system and its history. Years ago, Tom invited me to join a network of scientists and clinicians working to tackle some of these issues. Our network is developing a battery of biological and behavioral measures to identify children who are most sensitive to adversity, to capture them before overt problems appear so we can be more helpful, and to measure stress effects, resilience, and core capacities that are sensitive to the influence of intervention. For example, my work with Alicia Lieberman demonstrates that her five RCT evidence-based child parent psychotherapy for children with trauma not only improves child mental health and function, but it appears to slow and even reverse biological markers of stress-related cellular aging in those children. We're working with community partners to ensure that all measures are used to empower and not harm communities. Of course, more important than identifying and supporting those who are at risk is to eradicate or resolve the fundamental causes of disparities in health. In particular, my work aims to call out the harmful effects of income inequality, racism, and gender inequality. Sometimes the latter occurs in the form of violence against women, unequal opportunities, or lack of support for new parents. We're doing this in the hopes that we can prevent unnecessary harm from occurring in the first place. In some ways, support for these priorities has been perhaps the greatest aspect of Tom's mentoring, both in my science and in my personal life. Thank you, Tom. Congratulations on this well-deserved award. It's been a privilege working with you. Nikki, can we have, uh, let's have one question. Um, sure. The work is prevention. So do you think this could be taken on a large scale basis? And if so, who would, could it be for every child in the United States is something that pediatricians should be doing? Or are there ways to identify kids who are more at risk and would need some type of prevention intervention? Yeah, I think that is the million dollar question. There's, you know, precision and then, you know, accuracy of prediction and then there's scalability. And I think those are the tensions that we're wrestling with in this network and in all of my colleagues um, working groups. There's some things that are just more overtly risky and some will really depend on the context that children find themselves within. As Tom noted, we're finding increases in certain biomarkers of reactivity that could be a risk factor if the environment continues to be adverse. But if the stressor is removed and children are provided with an empowering, optimized environment that promotes well-being, it may be that that shaping of their biological indicators may be adaptive and actually lead to better outcomes. And so we're trying to better understand when to raise the alarm and find reliable, um, you know, measures really in constellation. No one biological mark is going to tell us very much. We're really trying to understand the interplay and multi-system um, approaches. And, and frankly, working with primary care, because it's a great place to capture these kids before they go and seek mental health often. Um, and many times pediatricians have excellent relationships with families and can really help us um, divert some of the need for uh, intensive mental health repair. It's almost as though the pediatrician has to be very aware of maternal depression because the chances of mom going back to the OBGYN after she has the baby is not as great as her going to get a well baby care visit from the pediatrician and if they were asking the right questions yeah. certainly that might be a, a good place to consider some kind of prevention since what you're reporting is quite upsetting that four years later you're seeing internal disorders yeah there's definitely a move in that um field of pediatrics to work with the families as a dyad, as a system, both with parents as, uh, sorry, fathers as well. They're quite important, although my research doesn't explicitly address that. And I think there's increasing attention to educating pediatricians about screening, not only parents for a range of mental health issues, but also parents for their own history of adversity and the child's current adversity so that you can better detect those who might need additional supports to prevent harm. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank our next speaker is going to be another one of Tom's protégés, Dr. Danielle Rubinoff. Um, Danielle? Hello. It is such an honor and a privilege to be here today and to honor Tom for uh, his lifetime of achievements. And so let me get my slides going. So in addition to conducting research with Tom, I had the incredible pleasure of also conducting clinical work with Tom. We saw children with complex emotional and behavioral issues at UCSF. And some of my most indelible experiences were with Tom 
were those in which we had the opportunity to reassure a worried parent, often a parent of a child who had experienced multiple adversities, that their child was not a, a problem child, but rather could be seen as an orchid who under the right conditions of love and support would go on to lead a very happy, healthy and, and successful life. And so it was really those experiences that I had in mind when I started looking at graphs like this one, which are similar to the graphs that you saw during Tom's talk. And of course, within these graphs, it is very clear that, the expo that ACEs exposure have these negative enduring consequences on, on children uh, all the way through, through adulthood. But I was struck by a, a different perspective that we can glean from this very same graph. And that's of those individuals who also experience these adversities and these traumas, but who do not go on to develop a physical or a mental health problem. And so you can see, you know, among of individuals who have experienced four or more exposures, four or more adversities, about half experience an episode of depression during their lifetime, but about half, even a little bit more than half, don't. And so that really led me to think about the question, how is it that some children maintain or even improve their well-being despite adverse exposures, despite trauma and stressors? And what we're really talking about here is promoting resilience, which of course is incredibly important for those children who are orchids, who are especially sensitive to their environment. So we know that these exposures that were uh, abuse and, and poverty and neglect tend to tip the scales towards negative developmental outcomes. So how is it that we balance the scales? What are the supportive factors, the protective factors, coping resources that can help balance the scales? And, and in some cases, not just balance them, but actually start to tip the scales towards more positive developmental outcomes despite the, the exposure to adversities. And that's what I started to explore in my work with Nikki and with Tom, specifically asking, what are those factors that promote resilience among adversity exposed children? And I want to share a couple of examples from our research. One thing that we looked at were neighborhood resources. So in a sample of children who were recruited for across the Bay Area, we looked at uh, census level measures of neighborhood resources. So these are things like uh, at the, from, from large scale nationally representative surveys, uh, the level of unemployment in a neighborhood, foreclosure rate, um, the quality of early childhood education centers, um, access to parks and green spaces. And we looked at how that shaped or modified the relation between family socioeconomic status and children's daily cortisol. So we know from decades of research that uh, children who are reared in lower income or, or low fa family socioeconomic status environments tend to have higher cortisol or, or more dysregulated patterns of cortisol. And we did see that in our sample. That was certainly the case that, that children from low family socioeconomic status households had higher daily cortisol. But really importantly, we only saw that among children who were living in these lower resourced, more disadvantaged neighborhoods. In contrast, children who were living in higher resourced, more advantaged neighborhoods, for them, we no longer saw any significant relation between family socioeconomic status and children's daily cortisol. So very similar to the graph I showed you or the slide that I showed you uh, a few moments ago of the, the scale tipping back into balance, that's kind of what you're seeing here in that shift from the, the red to the green line. And what that's really suggesting is that these neighborhood resources are operating as a protective or resilience promoting factor in the relation between family socioeconomic status and children's daily cortisol. Another example, uh, we looked at the quality of the teacher-child relationship. So again, drawing upon a sample of children who were recruited from the Bay Area, we actually asked children on the, about their perspective on their uh, teacher-child relationship, basically how warm and, and supportive um, and positive they felt their relationship with their kindergarten teacher was. And we looked at how that that again shaped or modified the relation between harsh parenting and children's externalizing problems. So we know from decades of research that harsh parenting tends to operate as a risk factor 
increasing uh, children's externalizing behaviors. These are things like um, aggression, uh, defiance, and oppositional behaviors. And again, we did see that in this sample. Uh, as harsh parenting increased, children's externalizing behavior also increased. But really importantly, we only saw this among children who reported low levels of closeness with their teacher. So in contrast, children who reported a more positive or, or more closeness with their teacher, we no longer saw that significant relation between harsh parenting and children's externalizing behavior. Here again, suggesting that uh, the, the teacher-child relationship is, is operating as a protective or, or resilience promoting factor. Now, the two examples that I just showed you really talked about kind of leveraging qualities of, of children's day-to-day -day environment, their neighborhood, their school. Um, but what about more formal sources of support? As a licensed clinical psychologist, I certainly think of mental health interventions as uh, something else that can promote resilience. But one of the things that I noticed in my work with Tom and Nikki is that research on mental health interventions seem to be operating independently of the research that we were conducting on children's psychophysiology, despite the fact that really integrating those two bodies of research had the potential to advance what we understood about child development. And so that's one of the things that I'm starting to pursue in my own work is that integration of mental health interventions or behavioral health interventions and children's psychophysiology. And what that looks like in an ongoing study that I'm conducting is measuring children's psychophysiology before and after a 10-week dyadic parent-child intervention for mothers with depression and their children with behavior problems. And that type of work allows us to ask some really interesting questions, things like, how do interventions promote children's resilience, both psychological resilience and physiological resilience? And how does physiology predict children's response to an intervention? So we might think about how to match a child to the most appropriate intervention based on their physiological profile, almost thinking of this in a you know, precision medicine framework. Now, I'm showing you again the same slide that you saw in Tom's presentation. And up until this point, I've really shown you things focusing on the right side of the graph, so different environments and the, the factors that shape those environments to promote resilience on various outcomes. But what about the role of time? Time certainly has a role in promoting resilience and children may develop along different resilient trajectories to be based on their developmental stage and, and the adversity that they've experienced. And actually there's some really compelling research on developmental pace. In particular, there's some research that suggests following an adverse exposure, in some cases, children's developmental pace may actually accelerate as if developmental time were contracting. In other cases, and in the context of other types of adversity, it seems like children's developmental pace decreases or decelerates after an adverse exposure. And this might suggest that children who are able to maintain a, a normative or a typical developmental pace might be the ones that are actually showing resilient functioning. And in a really compelling way, we're seeing evidence of, of these adversity-induced alterations in developmental pace across animal models, across plant models, and of course, across human studies as well. And it's really exciting because it might suggest different ways of identifying biomarkers as evidence of resilience or deviations from resilient functioning. And as I bring this talk to a close, I want to, to make the point that right now we are in such an optimal time to study resilience. Uh, I want to highlight a, a commentary that I had the opportunity to write with Nikki and with Tom. Of course, we know that this pandemic has such significant enduring consequences on, on children and on adults and families. But I think there have also been some really remarkable examples of resilience, and perhaps we think of them in ourselves and in our communities. And I think within those remarkable examples of resilience, there are these pearls of wisdom that we can use to advance the science of, of adversity and to help support uh, vulnerable children and families who are the ones that tend to carry the burden of, of morbidity and mortality in times like these. And so I'd like to end uh, by acknowledging my collaborators and, and team, and of course, a, a very special thanks to Tom, uh, who has lent me his, his shoulders to stand on and has really just inspired me to pursue a career I'm, I'm so passionate about. <laughs>
Thank you. Danielle, thank you. Can, can you go back to how would we, in this time of COVID, um, start looking on, on scale at resilience? What would be, how are you thinking about it? How can we do this as a joint effort? What should the nation's you know, pediatricians be thinking about or teachers be thinking about? Yeah, that's that's such a great question. Um, you know, one of the things that often is is lacking from research is actually measuring positive developmental outcomes. Um, it's often the case that we tend to focus on the, the negative consequences of, of adverse exposures. And of course, that's very important to do. Um, but oftentimes studies and, and, and research doesn't actually measure, measure positive developmental outcomes, things like pro-social behavior um, or, or positive parent-child relationships. And I think one place to start is actually incorporating some of those measures into our studies so we better understand um, how, how those factors um, uh, develop in the context of, of adversity or not. Okay. I, it's, it's certainly looking at the silver cloud, you know, the silver lining of a terrible event. So, and making us rethink um adverse events uh, i want to thank tom and uh nikki and danielle uh tom you are truly a giant um and the fact that two other giants are standing on your shoulders uh really gives us hope for the future and for our field um i want to thank all of you for joining us we're going to be back at 6 30 for the round table that nora volkow is going to moderate along with many of the former uh, sarah gunn honorees about the effects of racial injustice um, on child mental health and child mental health delivery and also the future in training. So we'll be back um, at 6.30 for um, the round table. Thank you so much for joining us. Well, welcome to our special round table. Each year on the shoulders of giants, it brings us together with world-class researchers, with ch children's mental health experts, educators, parents, and young people interested in the advances that are revolutionizing our understanding of brain and mental health and learning disorders. We believe this year is an important moment in history and hope that bringing together a panel of past and present uh, Sarah Gunn awardees for discussion on how to bring us closer to a world in which all children will have equal access to the care that they need. It's my pleasure to introduce our moderator for today's roundtable, my friend and colleague, Dr. Nora Volkow, the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse. And now I'll hand it over to Nora. First of all, I wanted to thank uh, uh, Harold, Dr. Koplewitz, not just for uh, inviting me to moderate this really interesting panel and for this wonderful uh, event, but very importantly for his leadership in the mental health in children and for what he has been able to achieve. And it's, it's quite remarkable, um, his trajectory. So as we are discussing in the in the shoulders of giants, I would sort of say we are basically very, very grateful for you to be able to carry everyone and facilitate uh, our, our work. So thanks a lot for doing that. Thank you. I, and I also do want to thank very much uh, Dr. Michael Milham and the dedicated staff at the Child the Mind Institute for organizing this event and for the, this work uh, into sort of probably one of the most important areas of medicine. Today, the round table is intended to further examine the disparities in access to quality childhood mental health care, which have been highlighted by the COVID pandemic. And importantly, uh, strategies uh, that we can propose to help move us uh, toward equity in service delivery. Everybody has been uh, uh, very, very clear in terms of how the vulnerability that COVID is bringing to all of us as it relates to stress is actually exacerbated among those that are more vulnerable. And uh, among them, children are of course at a greater risk. So uh, to address these issues that are complex, but extraordinarily important, we have a fantastic group of panelists. Uh, many of you uh, will know about them, but I still want very much to introduce them. Uh, the first one is the, our awardee today, Tom Boyce, Dr. Tom uh, Boyce, who is a leading expert on the interplay between neurobiological and psychological processes 
and he's a prof and, uh, current professor emeritus of pediatrics and psychiatry at the University of California, San Francisco. It's also a pleasure for me to introduce my colleague for many, many years, Dr. Javier Castellanos, who's a research psychiatrist uh, focusing on the use of imaging, including intri intrinsic functional connectivity based approaches for human and translational stories in mental illnesses. He's an endowed professor of child and adolescent psychiatry and professor of radiology at neuroscience at the NYU Langone Medical Center. It's also a pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Kenneth George, who is a leading scholar in the development and prevention of aggressive and violent behaviors. He's the William Dougal Distinguished Professor of Public Policy and Professor of Psychology and Neuroscience at Duke University. Also, a remarkable trajectory and career is Dr. Felton Earls, who's a child psychiatrist and epidemiologist and noted for exploring the causes of antisocial behavior. He's current professor of social medicine, Harvard Medical School, and professor of human behavior and development at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Then a long-standing colleague and friend of mine, Dr. Jasmine Herr, who is a noted researcher studying the neurobiology underlying addiction disorders and related psychiatric illnesses, one of the most innovative thinkers in the field. She's the Ward Coleman Chair of Translational Neuroscience and the director of the Addiction Institute at Mount Sinai. Then, no, needing no introduction, Dr. Jerome Akagan, who is one of the key pioneers of developmental psychology. He's an emeritus professor of psychology at Harvard University, a uh, co-faculty at the New England Complex System Institute. Then I sort of uh, also honored to introduce my colleague for many years at the NIH, Dr. Tom Insel, who is a psychiatrist and a well-known neuroscientist. And he was the former director of NIMH. He's a co-founder and president of MindStrong Health and a leader in many, many visionary ideas, including the use of artificial intelligence to help us determine who may be at greater risk for mental illnesses. And finally, not least, I mean, uh, with also an incredible trajectory, is Dr. John Wise, uh, who studies strategies for improving youth, youth mental health care. He's a professor at Harvard University in the Department of Psychology. So what is it that we're aiming to do today? There are two goals. I mean, as I mentioned, the COVID pandemic has highlighted the disparities in accessing quality mental health services for racial ethnic minority children. And so we can no longer ignore them. So this panel will examine the current state of disparities in pediatric mental health care underlying the challenges and obstacles to successfully addressing these disparities and identifying opportunities. And with that, I want to start the panel by allowing each one of the panelists one to two minutes to tell us in the area of disparities in mental health, adversity, and training, what do they think is more salient? So we will follow the alphabetical order and we can start with with Tom, Tom, do you want to start us off? So I, I think what I would want to say at the outset is uh, just to underscore um, the centrality of this issue. Um, the disparities uh, in, in health and health care uh, that are experienced by the minority communities of this country have been there pervasively for generations of time. Um, they exert powerful, uh, indelible effects on longevity uh, and on health in both childhood and adulthood. And they are, uh, frankly, uh, ethically untenable. Um, and yet they are really the, the disparities in health among ethnic minorities and in socioeconomic status are the most powerful determinants of disease and disease course. Um, that we have within our within our armamentarium of of uh, predictors. So, I think I would just want to say at the outset 
just underscore uh, how essential this is, how essential it is that we that we figure it out um, and that we begin uh, making inroads into bringing more equality, uh, more fairness um, to the health and well-being of our population at large. So thanks very much. Javier, your turn. We can't hear you. So um, I, uh, I think what was said at the uh, end of the presentations uh, is really where I would start, which is that uh, all of these multi-generational adversities that have accumulated over decades and centuries uh, have their greatest interactions in the next generation, beginning prior to conception, but certainly through uh, the gestational period and following in the early years and thinking through how to take the insights that we've already gained and really implementing those is one of those areas where I think we can have the greatest impact in terms of creating more and, and fostering more of the resilience that we were hearing about over the last hour and a half and finding out and figuring out how to take that on because what's happened is that we have fragmentation at every level and so the obstetricians uh, pass the baby on and the pediatricians, you know, uh, and, and family docs. Uh, family docs arguably are, are in the best position to have a, a more systemic perspective, but they're also the most challenged in terms of uh, how much they're trying to juggle in, in the, the few minutes that they're provided for, for each uh, clinical encounter. So we have a system that really puts band-aids on uh, problems that, that can use some thoughtful early interventions uh, with, with potential for greatly leveraged and, and powerful outcomes, but that's going to take a lot. Uh, the good news is that the crisis breeds opportunity, and so the current crisis really sets up the possibility for transformational changes uh, with real uh, union of, uh, of those who have been thinking hard about this, and, and policymakers. And so I think that it's going to take a real concerted effort to try and really leverage and change these, these trajectories. Javier, thanks. Um, Ken? Yeah, thank you. Uh, the disparities in mental health and in mental health care are inexcusable, outrageous, long lasting, and are going to continue until we change our entire system. Not only do we need more mental health services delivered, to individuals, but we need a, a primary system of care, of delivering those services. Uh, and until we have such a system, what's going to happen is that um, the haves will figure out how to access mental health services, and the have-nots will be shut out of the system. I, as an upper middle class, and probably all of us here, know how to access mental health services should we need them, and we can even recognize perhaps when we do need them not perfectly, but um, disadvantaged, disenfranchised groups don't know how to access those services. They are shut out. Uh, so the first point I would say is we need to develop a universal primary care system of mental health services that sees every child, even if they're well, because that's what pediatricians do. They have well baby care. Uh, they provide universal interventions. Pediatrician for my kids told them to wear seat belts and to get good nutrition. Right? We need that kind of primary mental health care delivery. And then that primary mental health care provider can screen, triage, identify those in greater need and connect families with early interventions that they need to have. We have no such system. That's why we have disparities. It continues because the haves like it that way. We can get the services that we need, whereas the have-nots are shut out. Our best opportunities for finding, for creating such a system might be in our schools, or they might be in a true extension of our healthcare system, which uh, is improving and does reach uh, many families. Ken, thanks very much. Uh, Felton? Well, I, I've been in... Uh... A difficult situation in the last with everybody else in the last five months 
uh, integrating the pandemic into my repertoire of expectations and wearing masks and having less social interaction with my colleagues and the racial injustice reflected in uh, the police brutality towards a uh, young African man. Uh, I, I feel very strongly that I have to adapt to this reality, that I wasn't adapted before, that it happened uh, and it, 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 it was something I knew about, but I didn't have the tools or the interest or the motivation to intervene. Uh, now I feel like it's important that I've become an active participant in society's serious long-term efforts to transform our society into a fair and a more just place to live for children. Uh, I'm interested in what science has to bear on that question of how do you dig in and change things. Uh, and what I come up with in uh, science is very little. I think we know very little that can help us address the seriousness of the social and political and environmental constraints that operate in our society. Um, one of the things that I, I've been reflecting on in, in the last week since we talked first was community policing because it's a, it's a, it's a well-established practice within policing. But I think that the, the, the training and the experience of community police is very shallow, that it doesn't change them much into community-oriented uh, practitioners. Um, so um, I think that community policing is something I really want to um, dig into and find out more about. Uh, I've been recently reading up on the Yale Child Study Center's uh, efforts over many years to, since 1991, Steve Marins at the Yale Child Study Center has organized a community partnership with the police department and social service agencies and the Child Study Center. And it has it's it's a it's a sustainable project that's been replicated in at least five cities I know about in 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 in, in the United States, but uh, I'm not sure how well it's been evaluated. And so uh, here's a practice that uh, is well established and with toolkits and curriculum and uh, anecdotal stories about people who have succeeded in taking it, but from a scientific point of view, it doesn't seem to offer us uh, much in, in the way of, of reproducible knowledge. I'll rest my case there. Tony, thanks very much. Jasmine? Yeah, thank you for including me in this discussion. I mean, it's so challenging. Um, as you said, um, you know, the past six months or so have really revealed a, a lot of the weaknesses in our society that we knew was there already. A huge thing for me, and Javier took uh, a number of the things that I um, I think are at least in my mind, what I wanted to talk about, but it is about taking a, the, everyone has to participate in how we change this, this systemic um, aspect of disparities based on racism for centuries. And there's a stigma, and the stigma of people feeling that when you help certain communities, you're just giving them handouts or you know welfare, but it is not. And until we have everybody who parts to contribute to the solutions, we're going to have the same problems. So the solutions for me, um, you know, and I, I I love well, I loved Tom's talk, I loved Nikki's talk, and Danielle's talk. But Danielle's talk for me in the aspect of resilience. And as a neuroscientist where I study epigenetic mechanisms, the one thing about epigenetics is that, yes, they convert aspects of this toxic environment and integrate it into the genome and changing genes and proteins and behaviors and the physiology and behaviors, but they're reversible. And Danielle's studies showed that even with the kindergarten teachers, how it could reverse those things from you know, the destructive nature of certain parenting. 
So we know that it's reversible. We know that we can change physiology. We can change neurobiology. But it's going to take more than just focusing only on the kids. We have to focus on the kids, of course. But we have to focus on the parents. We have to focus on the teachers. We have to focus on the police officers. We have to focus on the business people who are essential to also helping provide the resources to fundamentally change the school system, the, the school system, our politicians. So if we don't take a much bigger, big picture, if we're going to not shake this tree very much and only focus on one small part here or there, we're never going to make any significant changes. Yasmin, thanks very much. Uh, Jerome? First, I want to congratulate Tom and his colleagues and students for initiating really excellent research. There's no doubt that adverse events, depression in parents, and so on, have adverse effects. However, all the slides that Tom showed and the slides showed by the speakers that followed indicate the most important fact that class is the essential factor because class is correlated with all of them, with adverse effects, with depression, with illness, with poor medical care, with bad diets. And so there's a danger here in concentrating only on the psychological, you let the politicians off the hook and say, well, the psychologists can take care of that, and they can't, because the rising inequality in America means no matter what interventions you plan, you won't be able to solve this problem. This is a class problem. And so I think it's very important that future future investigators emphasize that class is the primary cause because class is the best predictor of every adverse event mentioned by Tom and the others. And until you close the inequality gap, it's going to be very difficult to mount interventions that matter. And I remind you of the high school project in which families in Milwaukee minority families were given enormous amounts of help, more help than any talk we've heard this afternoon. And what did you get 20 years later? Trivial, because the class differences had not been solved. If you read the final report, you would be extremely unhappy with the result of the millions of dollars that were spent on that small number of families and I, some of you may remember the investigator, I don't, who did high school project in Milwaukee. I guess that's my message. Jerome, thanks very much. Tom? Oh, thank you, Nora, and uh, pleasure to be with everybody. Congrats to Tom. It's great to see you and great to hear from you. Um, I, I, I would agree with others. I think this is a really tough set of problems. I. I'm probably the, maybe other than Tom, the only person calling in from California. So our last few months have been complicated by fires and climate effects uh, in addition to everything else. So yeah, I must say uh, this is a particularly difficult uh, period, especially for those who have had to be evacuated from their homes and for um, really thousands of people who have seen um, their counties destroyed. Uh, I was last year spent uh, much of the year working for the governor, visiting various parts of California, visit, and speaking of class differences and, and the changes in, uh, in, in inequality issues, 60% uh, of some counties are now rubble, they've been burned, and, and thousands of people have become migrants. So we are, um, it's not just that we're looking at uh, the problems of systemic racism that have been with us for um, now 400 years, but we've also got a whole set of new problems creating um, a, a sort of uh, an additional burden on the very people who have the least ability to respond. Uh, so these are tough, tough times, and I think we are going to have to think through uh, what our role is going to be. I'm not an academic, so I don't come at this from the standpoint of thinking about uh, what experiments to run. But I am in the world of policy and, and in the world of um, trying to find solutions. 
Uh, and, and I would say that in contrast to what Jerry just said, I think there are some solutions that we know about that are, aren't being used. And I guess one of the things that breaks my heart when I look at where we're at, because these are obviously complicated problems, there's no magic bullet, but we do have interventions that have been developed often with NIH funding uh, that have demonstrated uh, true efficacy, uh, both in the short term and the long term for um, helping uh, those who have the greatest needs. So just as an example, and we can debate this, I suspect, but nurse family partnership is an example of something that has been studied in uh, extensive RCTs now with 19 and 20 year follow-ups showing that even uh, the offspring of the kids who are in those, uh, in that, who received that intervention, their moms received it, um, show a, a far, far reduced level of criminal justice involvement. They're more likely to be working. They're more or less, less likely to be on Medicaid, a whole range of, of outcomes that are there even into the next generation. But that's one of, I think, multiple kinds of interventions that have been developed with good evidence. The real tragedy in this country is that we often know what works and it's not what we do. There is this continued uh, gap between what we know and what we do. And, um, that falls, I think, not on the uh, shoulders of the people on this call, but on those who make policy. Uh, and we are going to have to start holding people accountable to um, being able to put into place those things that really have some hope, maybe not of solving the problem, but of closing the gap for at least some individuals uh, in this realm. And, and I think it's, um, it's only gonna happen that way. We're gonna get this one bite at a time by finding the things that work, putting them in place and scaling them uh, either through technology or through uh, brute force. But that has to happen if we're gonna be able to start to close this gap. Tom, thanks very much. And finally, John. Well, I, I thought Tom, Nikki and Danielle did an amazing job. The presentations were so inspiring and they give us so much to think about, and including in relation to psychotherapy for young people, which is the specialty, my special area and my students and colleagues. Um, we've learned so much about um, the, the challenges that are faced by, by people of low income uh, and low resources because of the pandemic. So we're, you know, we're doing work, setting up work for uh, intervention trials in which all the intervention is going to be done remotely. And of course, all everyday care is now being done remotely. And, and there's a huge disparity in who has access to the platforms and even internet access to make this possible. So there's a lot going on in society in terms of the resources available. But what I'd like to focus on for a moment now is uh, a meta-analysis that we've done recently. We began to wonder with all the concern about racism in our society that surfaced so much over the last few years, we began to wonder if racism in the, in the environment that young people grow up in might actually have an impact on the, on the effects of efforts to help them with mental health problems. And so we took, uh, because I'm sort of a pack rat and I save studies, we collected you know, a large number of studies of youth mental health care randomized controlled trials, and we found 194 studies in which the racial uh, distribution of the sample was very well described, and we were able to identify samples that had majority black young people and majority white young people in these 194 studies. They spanned 34 states. We were able to take survey data, 31 items from three broad national surveys in these states to classify the states according to how racist the attitudes appeared to be. So there were questions, you know, give a couple of examples. There was a question, I'd rather not have black people live in the apartment building I live in. There was another that, um, that um, um, Irish, Italians, and Jewish people uh, overcame prejudice and pulled themselves up by their own bootstraps. Blacks should do the same thing. So the, you collect a number of items like this as possible to give each state a sort of numerical score for racial attitudes in the society. And then we looked at the association between racial at, racist attitudes in per state and 
the magnitude of the effect size of the intervention. And there was a, there was a either a beautiful or a terrible association between degree of racism in the state and the mean effect size of the intervention for black young people, uh, majority black samples, majority white samples, there was absolutely no association. If we have screen sharing, which I can't figure out in this system, I could show you the graph that makes this just so vivid. Is there screen sharing? With I don't think so. Oh, my screen. oh yeah, let's try this. I don't want to break up the rhythm of the conversation, but the graph is so vivid. Oh, well. Anyway, let me just say, it's a, you know, it's a straight line for majority black samples. It's a flat line for- We're seeing it. We're seeing samples. it, John. Pardon? Yeah. We're seeing it. It's there. Oh, you are? Mm -hmm. you see the graph? I can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, yeah. um, so, it, you know, it strikes me that that the impact of racism can be so pervasive in the lives of young people that even efforts by profession, you know, by professionals who are expert in delivering evidence-based interventions, the impact of those interventions can be mitigated by the social environment and the attitudes of the people in that environment of the young people who receive the intervention. And it and thinking about uh, Danielle's lovely presentation, it made me wonder if there can be strategies for building resilience in young people to the impact of the environment that they live in so that they can profit better from the efforts of those in their world who are trying to uh, help them develop in the most uh, beneficial ways. So that's my two bits. Very so nice, John. Much, And that leads me to my first question. And actually, of course, there's been a very diverse set of focusing on these issues and from the perspective of, yes, it is unethical and we know it is unethical and yet we are doing it. And as Tom was saying, despite the fact that we do have prevention interventions that have shown clearly that they are beneficial, we're not implementing them. And the notion about what is it from the perspective of science, is there something that we can do to incentivize this data these studies to be taken and implemented if if that were if there were data what data what information would you like to have that you think would be useful to change that gap between what we know and what we should be doing anyone well i think you need more than self-report as the index of improvement I think you need detailed behavioral observations in the Charles Natural Ecology. I mean, the data that is being used as the evaluation is really quite thin most of the time. So the first thing, is, and the second is to always analyze your data by gender, class, and ethnicity, because the effects are not the same. We have, Psychologists and psychiatrists love mean average scores. Average scores hide the secrets that lie within the data. And so the, the first thing you do before you do any analysis of variance is you look to see if the effects differ by gender, class, and ethnicity. And most of the time they do. So a uh, more uh, rely beyond self-reports and do a more comprehensive evaluation um, in terms of interventions. Anyone else want to comment on that? Nora, uh, Nora when I was at NIMH, you know how you have a council that you talk to and you get advice from, and I used to go to the council and say, look, we've got this huge problem with moving research into practice. Um, how are we going to fix that? And and we had long discussions about that. And finally, uh, Greg Simon is a very talented psychiatrist uh, researcher from Group Health said, that's the wrong question. The real question is, how do you move practice into research? How do you meet huh. people where they are, get into the real world of care, mm -hmm. get into the real world of experience and begin to learn from that in a way that makes sense? So uh, I work, you know, with, uh, I'm in Silicon Valley every day for there are 4 billion interactions on alphabet platforms, YouTube, Google search, 4 billion. You take a, a company like TikTok, which I think will still be called TikTok, whatever it ends up being uh, in the next couple of months, 
but they, you know, just, they have 300 million users on a daily basis. Up until recently, most of them were under the age of 18. They have 50 million users in the United States. The average interaction time on TikTok every day is 52 minutes. 52 mm. minutes for 50 million children. Well, not all children anymore, but 50 million Americans every day. Uh, that's where people are. Now the question is, how do you turn that into something you can learn from? How do you, because Google is able to learn an enormous amount about their members so well that they're able to keep them hooked on, on any of their platforms. Why aren't we thinking about that? Why aren't we trying to understand more about the things that really matter and finding things that actually are helpful to people by going to where they are instead of waiting for them to come where we are? You know, and I think it is an important point. I mean, the practice into the research and uh, and that is a crucial component. But but I do want to also come up with uh, the point that was made that the class has such a gigantic effect on outcomes. And class, of course, is very much uh, determined by socioeconomical factors. And yet we know, and others have looked at this, that one of the most important interventions that we can do to advance um, the class uh, socioeconomic situation of someone is education. And so what, what are your thoughts in terms of now, as it has been stated, I mean, a crisis like this one is opportunity. You all mentioned the access to technology and the ability now to provide interventions that in the past were not available, including quality education. I mean, what are your thoughts? How, how would one take it to the next level? So the question for me is, what is quality education? So a number of these kids who are from um, low socioeconomic communities, even if we have, uh, I think John talk, uh, mentioned, um, even access to not just the computers or the laptops that could be given to them, but in terms of internet access, but also just the environment in which they're, they're at home. They are not in huge apartments or huge homes. There can be a lot of chaos around them. So how do you provide education in an environment that makes it conducive for them to learn? But I do think it's a great opportunity because we can broaden the education that they would normally receive in schools often where there is not the best resources provided to these, to these kids. And so can we then tap into education that cuts across a community that cuts across a city, that cuts across a state or states. And so really target different types of learning opportunities irrespective of where their quote unquote home school is. But we still have to deal with the issue that not all kids are created, have an equal opportunity to learn based on the environment that they're in. But at least we can indeed think differently about how, what type of education that kids, all kids could have access to, but especially kids from lower socioeconomic communities. Because I do agree, I mean, a lot of times we, we talk about race and race is a social construct, but race is absolutely intertwined very much in this country with the aspect of low socioeconomic opportunities. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Tom. Yeah, Yasmin, I, I completely agree with that. And um, I think that one of the, uh, one of the things that we, are, are least able and least willing to talk about is the the role of money in all of this. Um, and just two or three points there. Um, you know, Raj Chetty, the the economist, formerly at Stanford, now at Harvard, has uh, computed the uh, the economic savings to the society of 25 year old children having a really good kindergarten teacher and how much that accrues over years of time in, in terms of uh, fewer adolescent pregnancies and less criminality and all of it. Turns out that the number is $320,000 a year. Yeah. Now, when was the last time you ran across a kindergarten teacher who made $320,000 a year? Um, you know, the, the fundamental uh, issue is and the, the original sin of of, uh, of racism is that is the socio socioeconomic blight that has been imposed on whole sectors of our uh, society. 
I think, you know, we need to be talking about money. We need to be looking at things like uh, Greg Duncan's uh, randomized controlled trial of uh, giving cash payouts to uh, low income families over years of time. We need to be seriously talking about reparations as a serious uh, topic of conversation. Um, money is, is the, the big unspoken uh, elephant in the room here. And, and, and Tom, I, I completely agree. I mean, it is very much in terms of money um, as one of the <clears throat> factors that has the largest impact. Um, there is not the only one. And sort of like you may be well off living in a neighborhood that is does not provide you the opportunities that actually is going to buffer the effects of having the resources. So it's um, how do we, I mean, I, I always think about it in terms of because we need to actually improve the opportunities for the children and the young people um, to provide them with resilience. So that's why education, I brought it up, and the other issue is uh, providing them opportunities for jobs and development. So now that we have COVID and this situation is going to get much worse, and it goes, got worse because we're losing jobs, and and economic deprivations are going to be greater. And again, the most vulnerable are the ones that are suffering the most. What would you think is most urgent to address? Um, if, you, if you were to pick up one thing, what would you want us to pay attention to? Nora, I'm not sure that um, we should try to find only one thing. And I worry that approaches that force us into one thing will polarize us and push us against each other. So if the one thing is to change our political system or an economic system, um, absolutely, I agree completely with what's been said there. But um, we also need to improve our mental health system and our educational system. And if we pit ourselves against each other, I'm not sure we're going down the right roads. I worry that if we only focus on improving our mental health system or our mental health resources, uh, we will rightfully be accused of trying to keep poor people poor by placating them and, and ameliorating their small level problems while keeping them poor, right? That's a political theory. Um, and, but that doesn't mean that we should only focus on finances. I think it has to be a, a both and, uh, and particularly, and, and, but we need to be thoughtful about it. It's not merely giving more money to low income people. Uh, my colleague Sandy Darity, an economist at, at Duke, has shown very clearly that wealth is equally or more important than current income, and that having family wealth enables children to grow up with hope and with opportunity to explore and to try and innovate new ideas. Uh, whereas if you're only focusing on current income, uh, it's not enough. As much as I applaud Greg Duncan's idea about giving $4,000 a, a year to low-income families. Likewise, on the mental health services side, yes, we've got to improve our therapies and we're doing a very good job of finding those but we also have to figure out how to deliver them to uh, the universe of the population. And I maintain that's a scientific question as well as a, a, a policy and, and political question. How can we deliver uh, an effective mental health system to the entire population, to move the entire population needle? As scientists, I wanna own that problem and challenge and not turn it over and call it a politician's problem. So as much as I like your question, Nora, I, I reject it a little bit um, because I think it's a both an and solution. Ken, you gave me the answer. You basically stated if we are going to address it, we have to do it in an integrated fashion, which was also the way that Jasmine had started. Everybody needs to get involved. And so from the perspective, and again, I apologize for this, but I'm someone that uses science as a tool and as a weapon to address issues and to help build policies. So from the scientific perspective, I mean, I'm just curious to see how are the models that we could test and be ambitious and say, okay, 
Um, we have a lot of evidence-based prevention interventions. We know that education is important. We know that uh, in, in family income is important, that support systems are important. And how would you take that into a plan to move forward, a study perhaps, that then can change policy? And is it possible or is it just this magical thinking on my part? Well, I, I think that building on Ken's idea and uh, Yasmin's idea that the solution has to be multifaceted, there has, there's so many directions to come at this challenge from, uh, you know, reminds me we have an election coming up in a month and we have lots of local elections surfacing throughout every year, all of which can have a huge impact on what policies are implemented and whether people are listening to the findings of science about what is good for children and families. So it, it's a, I think it's, you know, it's, it's a limitation of our field, or at least my knowledge of our field, that, I, I, that some of us, uh, especially me, don't have skills in translating what we're doing into a language that policymakers and politicians will listen to and that might actually impact votes. I wish there were more knowledge of how to do that. And John, I think that's uh, more difficult than ever. We have uh, we have lots of people who seem to not only distrust science, but actually fight against it. Um, and that's not being modeled in a way that any of us might want. Let yeah. me just suggest something that's a little different. It's a little further down the developmental cycle, but if you ask what's the what's the most egregious thing that's happening in front of our very eyes that our grandchildren will never forgive us for, uh, and there are many. But I think for me, uh, the one that I've seen in my lifetime, which I just do think is unforgivable, is the way in which we have criminalized uh, people with serious mental illness, uh, and particularly those people of color who have serious mental illness. Now that's not gonna be so much in children, but certainly in young adults, uh, if you're a black man with schizophrenia or bipolar illness, you're not going into the healthcare system. You're going to jail. And from jail, you're going to prison. And you're going to spend years, often in solitary confinement, getting at most very heavy um, doses of Haldol. Uh, and that's not an exception. That is the rule. It's a 10 to 1 ratio right now for people with serious mental illness being in the criminal justice system rather than the healthcare system. 10 to 1 at least on the public side. So is that fixable? Absolutely fixable. Uh, it doesn't happen that way in any other country in the world. Uh, and it hasn't happened like that here until the last 40 years. What we need to do to fix that goes back to what Professor Earls was talking about at the beginning, is trying to get at how we manage crisis in the United States. Oh, the way we manage crisis today, whether that crisis is due to serious mental illness or anything else, is we call 911 and we bring out the police with guns. Um, and that's why, you know, you know, one in four people who are killed by police encounters is a person with serious mental illness. That is preventable. There's a better way to do that. Uh, and by the way, that's not done in any other country. Uh, and there are now models for how to do this in a way that the call doesn't go to 911, it goes to 988. You get a crisis mobile team with a social worker and a nurse and a peer in a van, none of whom are armed. You don't involve criminal justice. The person doesn't go to jail. They go to a psych ER and they go to respite care. We know how to do this. It's being done in multiple places, but it's not being done everywhere. Um, and it feels to me like that is, it's a policy issue. This is not a science question. But it's unforgivable that we have allowed this whole area, which should be in healthcare, to become a criminal justice issue. And when people talk about defunding the police, you betcha. I mean, 10% of every local jurisdiction's police budget is for the response to and transportation of people with serious mental illness. 10% of the budget, 21% of their time is spent on that. Nobody wants that. So those are things that we ought to be able to do immediately and are not getting done because we're 
focusing on too many other issues. But that I think is going to be the thing that if I had one thing that I could wave a wand and say, let's, let's fix this, it would be to take people who have a bad brain illness and put them in healthcare instead of in jail. Uh, and we have done just the opposite increasingly every year for the last 35 years. And, and Tom, thanks for bringing the issue of um, the criminalization of people with mental illness and substance use disorder, because in fact, uh, it just actually to, leads to much worse outcomes uh, to them and to their family. And the data clearly shows that and addresses actually, again, that gap between what we know is very detrimental, not just it's not beneficial, it's detrimental, and yet we keep on doing it. And I always am very clear in my brain that if you can address something with a policy, you are going to have so much more impact. The, the problem is we're not doing the policies, nor are we putting the resources for the policies. So in trying to advance uh, for us in the science world or in the world that links science to investments, what can we do? What partnerships what we can create? How can we have a greater impact? Uh, although I agree with Ken, about the fact that it, it's dangerous to focus on one. I wonder what Ken and the panel think of the following suggestion. Since not every child who's poor and has had adverse events ends up in trouble, suppose every city had the funds that they test every child who they think is at risk, not every child who's about to enter first grade for just knowledge of letters, knowledge of numbers, and short-term yeah. memory, which are the best predictors of academic success. And you, you'll get about, depending on the city and the class division, you'll get about 25% who are really in trouble and they get special attention. And I'm saying that for the obvious reason that each culture values different things on its way to adaptation. This is not the 10th century where being a warrior works or a priest. I'm saying the obvious. Our, in our culture, getting through college is a minimum. And too many kids get discouraged. So if we can reduce the number of children who are at risk at age six or seven by half, I think you, I'm suggesting that you will have solved a major problem. And I wonder how ridiculous that sounds to the rest of the panel. Let me take that up, uh, Jerry. So um, one part of what you say, I think absolutely terrific, which is universal screening in a mental health primary care system. I think I quibble with you to focus only on letters, words, and academic skills, because I, I think should. the data show that much more broad set of social competence and social skills are going to be uh, equally or more important than life outcomes. But on the first point, I absolutely love the idea, and we don't have it, of creating a primary mental health care system where just like we have well baby care for pediatricians, you don't have to be sick to go to a pediatrician. You don't have to be sick to be going to a primary mental health care provider. We need different words because of the stigma that's currently applied to it. But why not from birth or actually from the prenatal period, because so much happening prenatally affects mental health outcomes of the offspring, beginning prenatally through birth, every year of a child's life, Let's have well baby family checkups on the yeah. mental health status right. of the family and, and identify where there are emerging problems. And then let's uh, develop a, a menu of community resources to address those problems. Sometimes it might be uh, the food bank uh, or a housing loan, or it might be uh, postpartum treatment for depression for mothers or it might be early interventions and cognitive behavior therapies for an early elementary school child. We, we know a lot, uh, we can do this. We just need to create a universal way of reaching every child, every family throughout the life course. 
beginning prenatally all the way through adulthood. We can do that. We've done it in healthcare. You can quibble about whether it works or not, but we can do it. We've done it in education with public school systems, and you can quibble about the quality of that, but it is those two are universal systems. Either one or both of them should take on the mental health task to a greater degree. And I'm, yes, John, please go. There's, a, there's an interesting model for doing what you're describing, Ken, uh, although it's based in the educational system, but at Boston College is a program called City Connects. And their role is not to create new services, but to identify the entire array of services in a city, Springfield, Boston, other cities and then do comprehensive assessment of all the children in elementary school at each year of elementary school and their families and identify which services in the community are already available that would be a good fit to the needs of that family. So that seems like a mini version of what you're describing. It is, John. It's a great example. I am familiar with it. Um, we also have a program for, called Family Connects that has a similar orientation. And it's helpful on two different levels. One is on the individual family level to identify what an individual family needs in this broad holistic way, and then to develop an electronic directory or menu of community resources to meet those needs and to connect them. That's what my primary care provider does for me in healthcare. We should be able to do it in mental health care. But then at a community level, Imagine that we are screening close to 100% of the young children or the infants uh, or elementary school children in our communities and identifying what the needs are. Then imagine that we truly do have this community agency directory of resources that are available to address those needs and aggregate those. And now you compare those two different figures and we can identify where we have surpluses and where we have gaps. In one study, we've done that, and we found that at birth, giving birth, the mother reported need and willingness to receive substance abuse intervention, self-reported willingness to receive substance abuse intervention at the birth of her baby, whether it's marijuana, alcohol, opioids, or some other substance, was 11% in the entire population. It's probably higher than that, but that's the self-reported. When we take the community directory of what resources are available actually to serve mothers who have a baby at home with substance abuse intervention, let alone whether they're effective services, just but any services, it was only two to 3%. We had a huge gap. You take those data to elected officials, and they, they might start beginning providing greater financial resources to meet the demonstrated need. Jasmine? So I think, I mean, I think these ideas are really wonderful, but coming back to, you know, some things like Tom said as well, and, you know, earlier discussions, how do we impact policy and bring, make and monetize it? Because our society, the people voting, they hear a lot of this and they think, oh, my taxes are going to go up. The people who have the high socioeconomics, they want to keep their money. They don't want to pay taxes. How do you pay for these things? How do you impact policy? So unless you engage non-governmental organizations that who have the resources and have them come on board to monetize, that it's a win-win in everything because I don't think the regular, quote unquote, regular um, person on the street who don't think that this affects them, they don't realize that it does. They don't realize that, yes, their taxpayers go, their, um, their taxes go a lot to keeping people in prison. They have no clue about, you know, how much of their taxes go to a lot of these things. So I, I think that, one, we do need to educate the society in general about the realities of a better, healthier, mental healthy, healthy uh, communities is better for them on every level. Their pocketbook, the communities that they live in themselves, their you know their neighbors. But I think we have to bring in policymakers and businesses to help make it so that it's a win-win of the finances, win-win for the families and, and communities. 
so I just, I just, you know, politicians are weak. They're there. They just will go for whoever is going to vote for them. And if certain communities don't have the money and they're not voting, they're not being represented. Yeah, Jasmine, and I think that you are touching it just exactly the polls, uh, the polls of uh, what uh, challenges, how do we monetize the interventions because then it's actually going to happen. And as we were discussing earlier on, I mean, we are in a pandemic. It's an opportunity to actually bring the urgency to it. But there also we are in the area of innovation and big data and artificial intelligence. And so how do we bring this stuff together so that you can be doing screening in ways that are actually have a predictive, a high predictive validity and allow you to do those tailored interventions, but also use these technologies to promote wellness and training. So how do we take all of this inventiveness that is surrounding us to actually use it to address this and improve the mental health of the new generations? make it put a big grant and tell people young people uh make a huge grant huge grants for you know innovation for this particular question mm -hmm. i bet you if you put money out there you know mm -hmm. hey tom you have some money <laughs> tom insel <laughs> get go at alphabet you know uh sorry I know tom so i think tom boyce in his hand up but just can i just yeah. put in one thing and this is in response to a couple of comments here there, America is a very difficult place to do any innovation right now. I just don't think this is the, the environment's not good for trying to do the kind of screening that Ken's talking about. At least that's my sense. But other countries are doing really fascinating things that we should learn from. There's a, a great project in Australia uh, called the Future Proofing Project. It's not perfect uh, in that it starts later. It starts at... Uh, at grade eight, so it's a little bit further along than where we might want to be, but it's every child in that grade in New South Wales is part of this project, unless the parents specifically opt out. Parents have to say they don't want their child to do it. Otherwise, it is understood that every child would become part of this, and it's very much what Ken was describing. It's a you know very um, thoughtful, comprehensive screening approach that will follow these children for five years to try to understand their experience through adolescence with lots of different kinds of tools. Some of them are cognitive, lots of dig digital measures, uh, getting family measures. It's, you know, it's like the kind of thing that you might dream of doing here, but it's been, I think, I mean, I'd love your thoughts about this, Ken, but I don't know that you could do that in the United States in 2020 uh, in the way it's being done in parts of Scandinavia and Australia interest in this in lots of other parts of the world. Uh, we're not that kind of country anymore. And whether that's going to become possible for us, I don't know. But in the meantime, we may need to learn from what others are doing, uh, where they are doing that whole population screening and following through with dense data, big data, uh, and lots of, lots of learning. Sorry, Tom, I, I didn't mean to interrupt because I know you had your hand up. You know, I'm just uh, going to point that that sort of thing, uh, Tom. I do, I do think that America is a place for innovation, and and so and we have an opportunity to challenge. I mean, there are different levels of innovation, but to me, that's an area of translation where we could take much more advantage of what we are doing, even though it may not be a gigantic innovation project. Um, small ideas can actually have a big impact, and I think that both strategies are are valued, but. I think that there was, um, who was raising their hand? Boys. <laughs> yeah, Tom, and then I'm going to challenge Javier because he has been quiet, then we go to Tony. <laughs> and then I want to open up for discussions in the audience. Um, Javier first or Tom, Tom next? Javier, you want to be first? I was wondering, what is Javier thinking? Well, obviously, they're thoughts. very, very smart people, but I'm also aware that we're dancing around this uh, event that's occurring over the next four weeks. Uh, people are voting now, and, and you know, uh, we have a chance, uh, maybe the last chance, to, to really make a difference. And I know that that's a difficult conversation. Um, Nora, I wish we could take you out of this, uh, this piece because of, of uh, uh, 
you know, your position. But I really do uh, want to endorse what Jerry has said. And part of what makes it so difficult is that the very uh, mention of class has been uh, bedeviled ever since the 1950s. We see this as, uh, you know, the, the, the quick road to communism. And uh, so we've lost out the ability to, to really think uh, deeply about that and its, its gigantic effects. Income inequality is only growing uh, and the people who are gaining the most have the most ability to maintain the system and to accelerate it to, to further, um, you know, their, their understandable desire to, to keep their, what they have, uh, what we have. I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, we're, many of us are, are in that group that, that sort of benefited from some of these things, but uh, at, at huge cost. So I'm, I'm always trying to find optimism. Uh, we've touched on uh, climate change and, and what's coming down that pike, and, and we're seeing it uh, every year. Uh, you know, it's just the most inexorable, inevitable uh, kind of accumulation of, of uh, data. Uh, I just can't imagine that more data is needed to make that case that we're going off a precipice. And, and that the amount of time we have to change that is getting shorter and shorter. So uh, to Tom's list uh, of, of you know, sins that we will regret, uh, it's just accumulating. So the only hope I have is for a gigantic wake up call that enough people uh, overcome the obstacles that are being placed in many uh, to, to make their voices heard. And that we then uh, as a people, uh, as a nation hold our, our represented leaders responsible. Uh, we've now uh, shown that you can take one and a half trillion dollars and pass that out as tax cuts for the rich, uh, and then several more trillion to try and, and sort of fill in the, the huge holes that opened up with COVID. And that's not even the beginning of what it's gonna take. It's gonna take so much more than that, but that's the kind of investment and that's the kind of opportunity that it could be opens up these questions of how do we truly transform a society that's going rapidly down the tubes and a, and a world that is increasingly going to be a hellhole, uh, unfortunately. Those of us with resources will be able to find, you know, our little ways of, of making through, but the vast amount of misery is, is going off the scale. So in a month, uh, in this country, we have a chance to make a definitive shift and to really, you know, all the gloves are off. There's no rules anymore. So if we can get majorities and, uh, and you know, administrative control, then lots of things open up. Uh, that's what I'm hoping for. Uh, I have your thanks. Jerome and Tony. Uh, I'll go. Uh, I've chosen to uh, focus on one thing. And that's involving children in the decision making and the understanding that that should go into the, in, into the decision making about their lives and their risk and their environment and the well-being and that they can expect to have as adults. Uh, so I think that it's very important that we think of children as agents in society, not necessarily uh, dependent on adults for everything, that they have opinions and um, and knowledge and commitments that should be recognized and articulated appropriately and powerfully in, in ways. Uh, we've, we've, we've been doing research in East Africa for the last 10 years, actually 15 years, in which we are teaching children the science of HIV infection. So they can go into their communities and talk about stigma and testing and uh, uh, that there are medications that, that are effective, but they don't cure the they don't cure the, the disease. They only stop the proliferation of the, the virus once a person is infected. So when it comes to the pandemic and racial injustice, I think children can understand uh, pretty well what's going on, particularly uh, young adolescents, uh, eight to 16 to 17. 
uh, that they live in a democracy. That's important. And they can help sustain that democracy and fix that democracy. Um, so these experiences of working directly with children as agents has turned out to be something that is uh, quite uh, astounding to us in, in that they, they get it. Uh, they're not irresponsible. Uh, they're not negligent. They are, uh, with guidance and, and safe spaces, they are willing to commit themselves to an analytical, rational approach to thinking about problems and pursuing actions. Uh, we just wrote a book that's published by Harvard University Press, and the title of it is Voice, Choice, and Action the potential of young citizens to heal democracy. Um, and the experiences we've, we've had in Chicago and Cambridge and uh, Romania, uh, South Africa, Tanzania, uh, indicate to us that we're dealing with a universal phenomena. That children matter, uh, have opinions, and have the right to express those opinions uh, in all societies. Yet they are mostly marginalized until the age of 17, 18, when they suddenly become citizens who can vote. And uh, by the way, when young people do vote, uh, they're, they're more liberal and tolerant and uh, progressive than older adults are. So I think the, the concept of citizenship is something that should be regarded at, at an early age, that you're a member of a society, that you're an active agent in that society, you do respect. And in, in exchange for that, you have responsibilities to be a, a knowledgeable and effective agent in, in your society. That's the one thing that I would... Said, and, and I think it's a very obviously a different attitude from what we take, but, but there is a lot of truth on what you're saying. Now, I'm also mindful of the time, and I want to give a chance to Jerome, who wanted to bring up an issue. But then I want to jump into the questions from the audience, because some of them are very, very good. So, Jerome? Yes. What is it you would like? No, I thought that you had a point you wanted to make to answer. No, no, no. I think Tom had his hand raised. Yeah, voice. Yeah, Tom well, I, I was, Nora, I, I did have my hand raised a few minutes ago. The, the point I was going to make, and, and by the way, I, I am completely on board with what Javier was, was uh, speaking of. We, we need a, nothing short of a national change of heart um, in how we think about uh, our obligation to our citizens, to our children. But the, the much more mundane, point that I was going to make in response to Ken's vision of, uh, you know, a, a more multifaceted, comprehensive approach to mental health uh, of children and adults is, is just the point that there is currently in our country uh, a kind of functional, conceptual, and physical balkanization of all of these, uh, these approaches that we have to dealing with the problems of youth and children. So pedi pediatrics and school, primary schools and education, legal services, community resources, we think of them all as separate, complete, completely different entities. Uh, pediatricians, the average pediatrician does not think of himself or herself as part of the mental health uh, um, service, but, but they should. <laughs> Um, pediatricians absolutely ought to be part of the the way that the uh, society addresses uh, mental health risk um, in children and and adults. Um, the schools ought to be pediatricians and schools ought to be co-located where there's active collaboration and active exchange of information. So the, the point is just that we we currently have this sort of quilt of uh, potential services that, that do not see each other operate, do not share information, and I think are less effective because of that. Uh, thanks, Tom. Very well said. Uh, 
And now I'm going to go into the questions from the audience. And the first one can go to anyone that feels comfortable answering it. And that is what is known about resilience and stress-related illnesses in countries with universal basic income? Hmm. Interesting. It's a great question that none of us appear to have an answer to. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in terms of, I mean, like Scandinavia and so on, I'm, I'm trying to remember the numbers. I mean, obviously things like it depends on the mental illness. I mean, there are things that are universal, irrespective of the healthcare system. It's how the people are taken care of that makes a difference. But I, I, I'm blanking on the numbers, like in Scandinavia, for example. I think the example we have in the United States is Alaska. So there, you know, every Alaskan gets a certain income based on the revenue or the state revenues. They actually have the, I think the highest suicide rate in the country. So I'm not sure uh, those things are related, but certainly it's not protective against uh, uh, mortality. Um, but I don't know the figures for um, the Scandinavian countries. I'm sure people have looked at this. In Canada. Mm -hmm. What it is, what the studies have shown is that their index for happiness is higher. But curiously and surprisingly, that doesn't necessarily mean lower suicide. But in instance, instances, it does mean lower substance use disorder. So, and uh, also lower levels of, of violence. I think that that is not a one-to-one, -one, but certainly there seems to be a protective effect overall. But I think it is, uh, but highlighting that because uh, we do see these high rates of suicide in these societies. I mean, there are other factors that play around, but I think that it does highlight when we think about not coming up with just, it's not going to be just one intervention that's going to make the difference. And I think that this is a component that has been the, the late motif on our discussions that need to integrate multiple approaches. Now, let me get over another question that I think is also extremely intriguing. How do we get over the fear of meeting young people where they are at? For example, TikTok, social media, without the fear of how our licenses could be impacted by our governing board. Any thoughts? I don't understand the question. What's the threat to a license? Uh, for... it's, it's the issue about HIPAA and uh, the fact that that where many of our young patients uh, or you know are, are, are the folks we'd like to serve are living is in, in the social cyberspace, and uh, that until COVID, uh, that was off limits, and then temporarily we're now able to use those uh, those means as a way of maintaining uh, clinical relationships, etc. Uh, I think it is an interesting question that that we are transforming uh, many aspects. I mean, the fact that we're having uh, this conversation, that we've had a symposium with a thousand people participating, uh, which would have not been possible no matter what if we were still uh, all physically there, uh, you know, in Midtown Manhattan, uh, suggests that we are moving into a different space where where we're going to have to uh, again force our our uh, our various masters to accommodate to these. Uh, but while we were talking about TikTok, uh, I, I wasn't familiar with Tom's statistic that the average use is, is almost an hour a day. Uh, and I think that that's, uh, again, not necessarily something to celebrate because uh, that's part of the the class situation in a sense that, that uh, you know, these companies are very good at using uh, subtle psychological principles to maintain eyeballs uh, for as long as possible, and that's maybe not the best way to educate the citizenship, the citizenry of the future. So, uh, in in many cases, uh, the leaders in Silicon Valley prefer to have their children attend Waldorf schools where there are no electronics uh, throughout the elementary school. Uh, that's the decision that that my family's made, for example. Uh, but uh, you know. It's a complicated world, but uh, in terms of, of being able to reach uh, through screens, I doubt that that's going to go away, although it's going to take some wrestling with the various state-by-state uh, -state licensing boards and, and uh, those sorts of bodies. But the work to try to do that is, is ongoing. 
if I can just add to Javier, I totally agree. And, and, and there's more to fear in these sites than there is to admire. Um, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't engage in some way. And I think um, we've been thinking about that, we being a bunch of us here in California. I've just launched a, a new startup called Humanest Care, which is really just dead set on this issue of how do you build a model that goes between the world of social media and the world of mental health care, brick and mortar, or even telecare as we know it. So we have licensed providers, often very experienced, and we train them to be influencers on Instagram or TikTok and to provide evidence-based messages, something that's actually helpful instead of the, the kind of toxic positivity and the doom scrolling and all of the stuff that makes these sites so awful. Um, and, you know, they build following. Sometimes we have a you know, we have some that have hundreds of thousands of followers. Uh, and then for people who need something more, they can come into the Humanest site where they actually get um, engaged with therapy or they get engaged with a group or with community or with things that we know actually work with trained moderators. So, uh, you know, I think going forward, uh, you could think of this as kind of Peloton for mental health. There are going to be these new models that people will develop that will be direct to consumer that will look very different. Uh, where kids will be able to get support in a way that they don't get today on social media. Uh, it's just starting. Ours is a first foray into this, and whether it works or not, whether it's sustainable or not, I don't know. Uh, we literally opened up the community yesterday, so it's you know it's still much to learn on this. But I, I think we need to be thinking about how are we going to build this 21st century mental health care system that looks really different than the 20th century mental health care system. And it actually meets people where they are and gives them what they want. Um, no, I think there's... So, so, so thank. And I actually, I realized that it's nine minutes before the 8 p.m. And I want to just feel one more question and then I want to give you an opportunity all to give us your last thoughts. Um, and But this is actually something that I'm very curious to see how you all respond. One of the panelists mentioned welfare how should this be revised based on your research? Anyone care to answer? What's I'm sorry, the question? I want to make sure I understand the question. The question is how would we revise welfare? A system of welfare as it currently exists, is there a better way of delivering welfare that would yeah. lead to a better uh, outcome? With the stigma, exactly. Yeah. Um, go ahead. Jasmine, and it'll be. No, no, I'm going to say to the a system would take oh. away the stigma. You know what I mean? That's yeah, what universal. Absolutely. Healthcare. Take away the stigma, make it universal, make the whatever the services are universal. That doesn't mean everybody gets the same thing, but it means everybody gets reached. And then you individualize identification of what they need and you provide it to them and you make it universal. It doesn't, by making it universal, I'm not saying that government needs to pay for 100% of all the costs because the financing is a different matter and you can have sliding scales and all, but it has to be one system rather than a segregated system for the poor of job training, of housing, of whatever it is. If it's a system for the poor, it's a poor system. It ought to be a universal system. That would be the first way it would eliminate stigma we know it would be higher quality because those upper middle class people if they were part of it they would demand that it be higher quality they would not let it get away with being poor quality right so i think that would transform whatever the services are within welfare ken thanks very much and i actually want to give each one of you an opportunity please don't go beyond 45 seconds because then we're going to kill the time uh, what is the message do you would want the audience to take away from from this really remarkable panel? Tom, you go first. Tom Boyce. 45 seconds. Oh boy. Well, I think in my 45 seconds, I would come back to the, the notion that we need a national change of heart. Um, we need to uh, change the way our services are provided we need to change the way our our children and our various populations and communities within the, the nation are valued uh, we need to begin uh, seeing ourselves as 
um, a nation that takes care of its people and votes in uh, politicians and leadership that will honor that and will uh, will uh, pursue that seriously. Thanks, Tom. Javier. Within the next four weeks, I think we're preaching to the converted. Uh, all of us that are listening to this need to vote. All of us need to talk to everyone we know to vote. It's the most important thing we can do in the next four weeks. Yeah, thanks. Again? Yes, I'm going to sing the same song. Uh, audience, you have the power. We live in a democracy. You can exercise the power. If you want a change of heart, if you want to get a more caring community and society, then vote for a leader who can show some empathy. Tony? Well, I have to echo what Ken just said. We live in a democracy. We've, we've earned a democracy. We've built a democracy and we're losing democracy right now. And everything else is a consequence of losing democracy. That if we lose the values and the sense of fairness that go into democracy, uh, and, and institutionalized in democracy, then we are hope, we will hopelessly abandon ourselves to uh, a very negative future for children. And they know it. They know it. Jasmine? Yeah, I mean, I echo, we're all in this together. And I think that this is the issue. We cannot solve this. One group cannot solve this alone. It has to be, as I started off with the village, we can't let people put us in silos and divide us because every single community that's helped helps you as well. And I think that this whole thing is that people put the us against us versus them. There's no us versus them. We're all in it together. And until we understand that, we can solve all of this if we do it together. Uh, Jasmine, thanks. And uh, Jerome? Uh, I remind the audience and the panel that the reason why Donald Trump won in 2016 was that the poor felt they had no agency, right? And that's why he lost. So the most important thing we can do is we must close the inequality gap so that those who are disadvantaged now feel a sense that it's not fatalistic, that they can improve their lives because that's what's missing. Jerome, thanks. Tom? I'd like to suggest that um, the election be held today and be held by the people who are on this call. <laughs> um, but that's not going to happen. So what I would, in addition to everything else that people have said, I, I would want the audience to go away with a sense of hopefulness. I, I do think we know what to do. We know things that work. We have something to offer. Uh, now we need to figure out how to get it there and how to make sure that those in greatest need are getting uh, the most support. Uh, thanks, Tom. John? Uh, yeah, I love Tom's uh, Insel's optimism, and, uh, and I'd like to support that. I think all the things that we're proposing here in this panel, all the great ideas, will be much easier to facilitate with a government that supports these ideas and that values science and and so i think we we have the opportunity to make that happen and i think it can happen at a national level but it also needs to happen at many different local levels because so much of the power resides in state legislatures and even municipal governments uh, i want to thank the panel i mean for having been so candid and for your thoughtful um comments and suggestions i think that clearly we're all here together we were able to bring our own experiences to try to address one of the largest challenges in, in front of us and the reality is if we do integrate our efforts we can address it and so the issue is of course how to integrate that effort and i think that many of the comments that have come up are are things that are actionable um not just theoretical constructs but things that we can do to improve uh, mental health and uh, obviously the wellness of all the citizens and with that i would like to turn the microphone to uh, harold because actually i i want to again thank him for bringing us all together and give him an opportunity to say goodbye to everyone Harold. <laughs>
I'm putting you on the spot. Uh -oh. So actually, oh, instead of like, oh, you have mic. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I'd like to thank you all so much for attending this evening's presentation and roundtable discussion. I'd like to thank Drs. Tom Boyce, Nikki Bush, Daniel Rubinoff, our rising scientist scholarship winners, Sarah Gunn and Dr. Harold Kaplowitz, our panel moderator, Dr. Nero Bokal, and our panel, Drs. Javier Castellanos, Kenneth Dodge, Tony Earls, Yasmin Hurd, Jerome Kagan, Tom Insel, and John Weiss. Uh, it was an honor to have you all with us tonight and a pleasure to listen to your presentations and powerful discussions. My biggest takeaway from being here today, from listening to the presentations and panel discussions, is the value of keeping an open mind in approaching the science of developing brain, as careful investigations of noise and outliers can reveal missing clues. The importance of tuning into the world we live in and thinking about the many sources of stress and adversity that can impact the neurobiological, psychological, and physical development of our children. In the midst of the many cautions that we've heard tonight, are clues for developing targeted and potentially scalable interventions promoting resilience across environments and experiences. Uh, and equally important in these times of crises are the growing recognition and will to bring the multiple stakeholders together to action these clues, old and new. Uh, as highlighted by our roundtable, it's only through focused collaborative efforts that we'll be able to achieve the changes needed to ensure that every child will have a fair and equal opportunity to realize their true potential. On behalf of the Child Mind Institute, I'd like to thank you for joining us for our annual On the Shoulders of Giants Scientific Symposium. Thank you and have a good evening.